going to introduce you to an outstanding coach in boys volleyball, Bill Schultz. Bill has been coaching a boy, varsity boys volleyball team for 22 seasons. Uh, he has a Niagara Frontier League record of two, 206 wins and 50 losses. And since 2018, and it was interrupted a little bit with COVID, to the present, he has 46 consecutive NFL wins. So it's still going. It's a remarkable record. So congratulations, Coach. Um, he's been named Coach of the Year seven times. And in two th or he has eight NFL championships. And we have one more championship that happened in 1997. It's the first time we ever had a boys volleyball championship. And that's when Bill was a Viking. <laughs> in 1997. So he was on the first championship team in the Niagara Frontier League. He had three Section 6 championships and uh, one New York State championship in 2019, and it is our only state championship. So congratulations to Bill, and before he comes up here, I just want you to know that he was just in November inducted to the Western New York Men's Volleyball Hall of Fame, and it just started a few years back. So, a Hall of Famer in the class of 2021. Congratulations to Coach Bill Schultz. Uh, okay, Bill, come on up. He has built the program, and obviously we are at the top of the Niagara Frontier League, and we're close to a section title each and every year. We were supposed to have a down year this year, and he still goes undefeated. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much for the recognition. Um, this season, uh, we had to do some rebuilding, but not a lot. We still had a main core group. We were 12-0 in the NFL this year. I don't think we dropped a set this year in our league. Um, repeated as league champs. Um, made it to the section finals again for a third time in a row. This year we were unfortunate to win that one. It was a tough match. Uh, went five sets, ended up losing by three points. Um, we had six players for an all first team NFL, or well, between all first team, second team, and third team. I have two of them here. Can I get you guys to stand up, Nick and Paul Wynn? Nick was first team and also NFL player of the year. Paul Wynn there was a first team uh, libero for us on all NFL. Others that couldn't make it were John Simpson was first team, Eddie Korjak was first team, Jared Dobler was second team, and third team was Taylor Newton. Eddie Korjak was our uh, first team all Western New York selection for uh, Grand Island this year. Thank you. Uh, coach, quick question. I know we're talking about our varsity team, but um, could you just the award that Coach Quinn, our JV coach, won this year as well? And yes, uh, Coach Quinn JV, he um, was uh, coach of the year for the JV team this year, and they were undefeated too. Um, they also have been having a great program, and they've been undefeated also in the past couple of years. Thanks, Next up, and I apologize for being a little too long, if I am, but these coaches don't get enough recognition as far as I'm concerned. And people really don't know the dedication and the years they put in and the sports they coach and their unbelievable records. So this is why I'm just happy to take some time and uh, let everyone know how successful they are and how determined they are. Next up is our girls tennis coach, Don Craig. Our girls tennis team 
had a record in the um, shoot, let me skip that a little bit. Let's back up. Our girls' tennis team was coached by Don Frey for four years. Um, if you're thinking he's been around a little longer, yes, he has. He's coached boys' tennis for 24 years, and he was probably the main guy and the reason we started our Varsity Boys Federation Hockey 11 years ago. So he's coached three sports for the past uh, four years. Girls tennis, the last four years, he's had an NFL record of 43 and six. He's had two NFL championships, and he's been the, uh, and his team has been the, been the New York State Sportsmanship Award um, this year, and the NFL Sportsmanship Award. Uh, Don also coaches boys tennis, which I mentioned, 24 years. His record in the Niagara Frontier League is 213 and 16 losses. And he's had two NFL Coach of the Years. He's had eight NFL championships. And he's had two NFL Sportsmanship Awards. So not only do his teams produce and win, they're good sports on the court. In boys hockey, in the last 11 years, he's had four division championships one section six championship that came in 2019 and he went all the way to the New York State Finals in 2019 to play Skinny Atlas on their own ice at their own home. So that was a tough one, but he got there. Uh, Don is well, um, well known in West New York. Um, the section has given him the Niagara Frontier League Male Coach of the Year, and he was uh, recognized at the Section 6 uh, banquet in August as the Section Sportsmanship Award. And uh, that was back in 2013. So basically what he did is he represented our Niagara Frontier League as the male rep for the Section 6 Sportsmanship Award of all the high schools. In 2019, the West New York Dominic Hashett Coach of the Year Award went to Don also. So just a terrific career. I want to thank him. I'm going back five years when we uh, you know, our, our other coach stepped down and uh, Don took it over for girls tennis and right now uh, I know Don will get up here and he will mention his all-stars and the successful season he had which was undefeated. Don. Thank you, Mr. Roth, and uh, thank you to Dr. Graham and the school board for the opportunity to recognize uh, the girls' tennis team. Um, I, I have the easiest job this year because uh, the girls are just awesome. They're just a, a great team, and um, we have so many uh, talented individuals and um, talented girls on the team. Finishing 14-0 against uh, the competition in the NFL, uh, really the highlight is when we can beat Niagara Wheatfield twice and, and, and that's something again to always battle them and win uh, the Niagara Frontier League title. I'd like to recognize tonight the girls that um, were voted to the 2021 NFL All-Star team in the Niagara Frontier League. Um, we'll start first with Willie Kozlowski and Claire Lefebvre. They were our second doubles team. They were 14-0 and 0 on the year. And they were again voted second team in NFL, they had an undefeated season, playing first time together on the tennis team. So I don't know if Lily and Claire are here, but they had an awesome season. Next up is our first doubles team. So Mia Schiffmacher and Alicia Hunt. And I see Mia here, I'm not sure if Alicia is. Mia, if you could stand. They were. 12 and one as a doubles team. First team NFL recognition. They qualified for the Section 6 tournament and did an outstanding job there. 
And again, uh, just a, a solid count on point throughout the year. So congratulations, Mia and Alicia. Second team, first singles, Riley Weber. Riley is 14-0 at second singles. Uh, NFL second team recognition. She did a play-in match to qualify for the Section 6 tournament and did an outstanding job there. So Riley, congratulations on your Section 6 recognition. And then first team singles, Kirsten Brown. Kirsten? Kirsten was 14-0 at first singles, NFL first team in the Section 6 tournament. She finished second. This was her fourth time to the Section 6 tournament, winning it once a couple of years ago. And this was her fourth time qualifying for the New York State tennis tournament held in the Albany Schenectady area over the past four years. And Kirsten, are we still undecided? No. Committed to Mercyhurst University, so congratulations. <laughs> and so once again, uh, Dr. Graham and the school board, thank you for the opportunity to recognize the girls on the tennis team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nan, and uh, congratulations, Kirsten. I go by it. She's uh, one of the probably, arguably, the best player we've ever had at Grand Island. She's a uh, big serve, great for the baseline, and it was uh, enjoyable watching you play this year. And of course, uh, Riley, the same thing at second singles. I don't think I ever remember a second singles girl playing as well as you. So congratulations. Last but not least, of course, is our football team, Coach Dean Santorio. Just think about some of the things he's accomplished over the years, and it's, uh, it's remarkable. First off, he's had 21 varsity seasons in football. Uh, his league, or you say division record in football, is 123 wins, 68 losses, and that is about a 65% winning percentage. Uh, he's made the playoffs 16 to 21 years. He's had six league championships, two section six championships. He's rated, uh, ranked uh, number 25 on the all-time Western York career wins with 123, as I mentioned. And moving up the ladder, uh, now, some of the things that he brings uh, that a lot of the other coaches don't get the chance to get, but Dean does it year in and year out. And another guy that never has a down year. His program is second to none in Western New York. He's in the top ten every year. He's been the seven-time Buffalo Bills Coach of the Week, which comes with a, I'm not sure, Dean, thousand. Thousand dollars. So that's seven thousand dollars he's made. And he, Ruby, he just puts it in his pocket and goes shopping. Christmas shopping. Yeah. <laughs> he's been the seven time coach of the year in division uh, uh, in class A in the divisions. He's been a three time annual recipient of the National Football League. All Pro, which donates or donates a grant to the school district of their choice, and because of Brett Kerr, 2003 punter and Grand Island alum, he has been All Pro uh, three years in a row, and it was ten thousand dollars a year, and it's thirty thousand dollars that Dean gets to spend for his football program. So. This is the type of things that he has generated over the years, and it's just been remarkable. I'm going to mention baseball because sometimes we never get a chance to talk about the spring because it's kind of exams going on, uh, sectionals going on. But his baseball career, 21 years of varsity seasons, uh, really 22, but the COVID year was canceled. Uh, 
Um, his overall record is 256 wins, 135 losses, five NFL championships, two Section 6 championships, and five NFL sportsmanship awards. In 2012, a lot of you remember, they went all the way to the state finals and lost eight to six. Uh, unbelievable without his top pitcher who was hurt all through the whole uh, sectionals and the states. So at this time, um, I'd like to bring up Dean Santorio, one of the West New York uh, deans as far as uh, football goes. He's one of the older ones, believe it or not, look at him, he looks about 35. So Dean, come on up. I certainly didn't feel 35. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. Wasn't expecting that, but I appreciate it. And to the school board, Dr. Trent, thank you very much for recognizing all of our fall athletes and our teams. Obviously, we got some great coaches that do wonderful things for our kids, but I, I told our kids at our banquet that hopefully we're not recognized or defined as coaches or as teams by our wins and losses. We all want to win, obviously we work hard to do that, but hopefully we're defined by the character that we show, not just on the field, but in the community and at the school. And hopefully, I, I told our kids, we're defined by what you see at the end of the season, by the love they show each other when they know it's all over. Um, that's what's most important. So obviously wins are great, but it's not the only thing. Um, I think our greatest team accomplishment this year, we're 6-0 in our, our league. Um, we were the number one seed in the sectional playoffs. We unfortunately lost a close overtime game, which was a heartbreaker in terrible weather. Um, and it's always disappointing whether you lose in the first round or in the sectional finals. But we had a great group of kids. Um, we said as coaches, maybe the most enjoyable group we've ever had as kids themselves. Um, but our greatest accomplishment, we were able to lead the league in scoring um, points per game at 45 and a half points per game. We also gave up the fewest in the league points per game at seven and a half points per game. So obviously great accomplishment as a team. Um, we had a number of um, all league performers. We have some that couldn't be here because of basketball and hockey, but our quarterback Justin Horvath was first team all league. Uh, running back Ryan Bielek, who's here, stand up, first team all league. Um, my receiver, Tyler Figliola, was first team all league. One of our linebackers, Josh Malavar, was first team all league. Um, Liam Snyder could not be here. He's playing hockey. He was the linebacker, first team all league. One of our offensive linemen, Sean Mesmer, who's here, was first team all league. And our kicker, Spencer Heck, who's here, was first team all league. Give round. Our second team all league performers, the senior offensive lineman Isaac Quick could not be here because of basketball. Um, one of our offensive linemen, Matt Rizzo, second team all league. Our center, who's a sophomore, second team all league, Doug Crowley. And safety, um, a sophomore, Brayden Willits. We also had two honorable mention all league players um, who could not, one could not be here, senior Joe Dugokinski at cornerback, and offensive lineman who's here, Michael Christensen. <laughs> as far as um, end of the year awards, Justin Horvath, who threw 25 touchdown passes, only three interceptions, 1,700 yards passing, was Class A North Offensive Player of the Year. Um, Justin Horvath, Brian Bielek, and Tyler Figliola were all named today, actually, to the Niagara Gazette All-Area Team, so there are three out of 11 kids in mostly the Niagara region plus Grand Island, so that's quite an accomplishment. Jackson Jones, who could not be here tonight, and I am sorry, I missed Jackson Jones. Jackson Jones, defensive back, was also first team all league. He's out of town. Um, but Jackson Jones also won the uh, all-character team through cross-training football, which is all based on character. So he won that. 
Justin Horvath and Tyler Figliola also were named to the Academic All Western New York team. So congratulations to those guys. Thank you very much. Outstanding young people in this audience, so respectful. Every time they see me, they come up, shake my hand, say, how you doing, Mr. Roth? It, it's such a breath of fresh air to see these scholar athletes, student athletes, uh, and also all leaders, as you might guess. And just this weekend, from what I hear, was uh, Brian Bielek. He won the championship in Syracuse, was it? The Phoenix Tournament? What weight? 172. Congratulations. Now, I promised you I would uh, announce our All-Stars and the other uh, sports, and by no means did, were, did we have anything negative about any of the other sports. In fact, uh, we got so many positive vibes out of uh, the rest of the programs that weren't championship teams. And as Michelle mentioned, and uh, uh, you know, these kids, they, they work so hard each and every day. Uh, girls volleyball, uh, Coach Amy Boutte and her JV coach Heidi Jank is here. They finished second in the Niagara Frontier League to Niagara Wheatfield. Niagara Wheatfield went all the way to the state finals. Uh, our boys soccer, coached by Frank Butcher. Uh, best record in the Niagara Frontier League, he just happened to lose the biggest game of the year in regards to the Niagara Frontier League, and they lost in the crossover against uh, uh, Niagara Wheatfield, I think. Am I right on that? Yeah, I think so. Yep. I should know that. But uh, I'll start it off with the boys' soccer. And uh, I don't know how many are here, but I saw I saw a couple of them. Um, third team NFL All-Star, uh, Kaito McGee and Angelo Aiello. Stand up. <laughs> Second team All-NFL, we got Jacob Jamie and Sam Jamie. First team, all NFL, we have Sean Graham and we have Anthony Amato. And both Sean and Anthony were named to the All West New York team. So congratulations to the boys soccer team. They still had a wonderful year. They all went all the way to the uh, section class uh, B1 finals. So congratulations. Uh, I also will pinch hit for my golf coach, uh, Ryan Donnelly, in his first year in golf. He, uh, he was a, he's on a mission taking it over for Craig Worthing for so many years. He's on a mission, working already in the off season, and he's also my uh, assistant hockey coach and modified baseball coach, and this is what these guys do. They work very hard all year round. He had one first, oh no, it wasn't first team all league, it was a second team all leaguer, but it was Dylan Novak who was playing basketball tonight, so he couldn't be with us. Um, the last two teams, I'm going to have the coaches come up here. First year coach for girls swimming and diving, uh, Alicia Saprowski and Nate Link. I know Alicia's here. Um, so many positives came out of this year's girls swimming and diving team. Um, they seemed to peak at the end of the year, and she had a couple uh, all leaders, so I'll let her come up and introduce them. and the board for having us here. It is certainly awesome to be able to recognize these athletes. They put a lot of time and energy into what they do, and um, we're just here to support them and hopefully give them a, a good time while they're doing it. So I was happy to join the uh, coaching crew this year and look forward to doing it in the future. I have two athletes here tonight. 
both of them juniors, so I'm super pumped to have them back next year. I have um, Anna Donnelly, who was named third NFL All-Team. Stand up, Anna. And I have Morgan Miller, also a junior, here, second team NFL All-Team. Congratulations, girls, and thank you for having us here tonight. Thanks, Alicia. Wonderful job this year, and congratulations to those two swimmers. It was in the 100 free for Morgan, and Anna was in the uh, 500 free. So, very, very well done. Last but not least, we're going to call on our girls' volleyball coach, Amy Boutte. Her JV coach is here with her, Heidi Jank, and they will be, again, building the program, and I know they will. Uh, Come on up, baby, here's your Thank you to the school board um, for listening to us kind of brag about our kids. I will also give a shout out that I think most of my sports and entertainment management club is in the audience tonight. So um, it's great to see how many amazing athletes we have at Grand Island. So volleyball, we had a successful season. Um, like uh, Mr. Roth said, we did lose tonight in Wheatfield, who seems to be our arch nemesis, both at the JV and varsity level. So we plan to get them next year for sure. I want to spotlight some of my amazing athletes in the audience. So um, two of my three, well, all three of my seniors are here. Molly Leggett, Casey Gottler, and Pascal. They had a really hard job of coming back after a really short season, um, leaving, leaving behind some really great seniors who we graduated last year who won the NFL. So to come back and kind of be the leaders was a huge um, accomplishment for them and they did awesome. I also want to acknowledge Anna Kurtzels who won uh, third team NFL this year as a starter, she's a sophomore. <laughs> Two of our other all-stars who aren't here tonight are Emma Santorio, she won second team all, all, all NFL, and Madeline Quadero who won first team all NFL as well. Um, and my last shout out is to Tess who also won first uh, team NFL, also won fourth team all state for volleyball, and she has committed. She has committed to play volleyball at Clarkson University, where she's going to be studying environmental studies and policy. And I will tell you, this is like my first official season with these girls who have coached for JV forever, and it was just a pleasure. And I'm so thankful to be coaching at a school that I graduated from with an athletic director who is my athletic director. Um, and so it's just really, it's a full circle moment. And I also have to give a shout out to Heidi Jank, my JV coach, who is my other half. And I'm so excited to start to build this program um, with her by my side. So thank you so much, girls. Congratulations, and thank you. Thank you, Amy. Great job. And uh, Molly, did we win? Yeah. One nothing? Yeah. Way to go, Molly Leggett. She rushes here after her hockey game. Uh, I just want to thank the board and everyone for um, allowing us to just showcase all our outstanding athletes and our outstanding coaches and all the all-stars, what we do every fall season. So thank you so much. invite you all back for some cake. So go ahead and help yourselves. We have some cake for our fellow uh, athletes.
Hello, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rick Timms. Dr. Timms is well known across New York State as a consultant to various educational finance entities, and he continues to provide a variety of research studies, development projects, and strategic planning as well as mentor mentorship across the state. Dr. Tim is retired as a district superintendent of the Erie II Chautauqua Cataragas Boces. He also served as superintendent of Spencerport in Monroe County and in Orris County Central School District in Oneida County. He served many years as the Oneida Boces Superintendent's Cabinet Chair and he was president of the Tri-County Superintendent's Association. Dr. Timms is a master of New York's complex education funding structure as executive director of the statewide school finance consortium, which includes more than 400 school districts. Dr. Timms is a frequent presenter at workshops and conferences and has written numerous articles on educational development, the use of data to improve instruction, and of course, educational finance. As president and CEO, Rick Timms Incorporated and R.G. Timms Advisory Group, he is a consultant to various educational finance entities, as I mentioned earlier. And over the past two years, Ruby and I have been concerned during the budget development about the steady decline in our reserves. After careful consideration, we decided to move on from our previous financial advisor and bring Dr. Timms on board as our new consultant. We have asked him to thoroughly review our finances and assist us with a long-range financial plan. Today, Dr. Timms has prepared a presentation that will outline two possible scenarios for us to consider as we look ahead in the budget development process in the weeks and months ahead. So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Timms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Grand Island, and we've been working very hard. I want to thank, first of all, Brian and Ruby for bringing me on board. As you said, they were a little concerned about the reserves and some things in finance, and we've decided to take a look at just about every financial characteristic of the district and all the domain. Uh, particularly, I've got to thank Ruby because I think morning, noon, and night, because I have her cell number, I have been calling her asking her questions for a long time. So if you've got a copy of my PowerPoint, I'll just run through it here with you. If you have any questions, just interrupt me on the way, and we'll see if we can go through this. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is, is that we're going to come up with a couple plans for you to look at. But our data is not just kind of a characterization of what we think is going on. I think you've got to be aware that we've got a number of pieces of data. For instance, if you look at page two, we use the actual submissions for the State Education Department, known as the SD3s. These are the official documents of the school district. And we've actually looked at your district currently and five years prior. We also take a look at the New York State Department of Education website for aid calculations. You are heavily state aid dependent. So when state aid is good, you seem to do better financially when it's not so good. And in, in the last few years, state aid has not been good to you. Uh, matter of fact, you, you're owed a considerable amount of money. Uh, we look at your external audit reports for their recommendations. We also take a look at your capital expenses because those are part of the tax cap. We take a look at all the capital project data, how you borrow money, uh, how much you owe, how much you use, what your state aid is, all those types of things. We also take a look at the use of capital reserves and reserves in general, and your debt service schedules because all this will affect your tax cap. We also look at all the other categories of state aid. I'm going to give you an example of the categories of state aid, and there are quite a few. It's interesting, uh, listening to all the, uh, the, the statistics you just heard just over the beginning of the meeting. Now we're going to get into some really big numbers, and actually there's a lot of data here, so it's probably going to take a little while for you to absorb it all. But this is a great start to look at some of this. Uh, as I said, I've interviewed, I think, uh, Ruby uh, so much, uh, you know, I think she has got my cell number, I have hers, and we're in constant communication about the numbers. Also, I've had uh, discussions with uh, Dr. Graham, 
as well to keep him in, in, in the loop. Uh, and we've taken a look at not just your capital reserves for capital projects, but we've looked at all the reserves because I think the use of the reserves actually spurred their interest in having me come on board. I've also taken a look at the uh, reports from the controller's office just to make sure that the district can stay in compliance. And we've taken a look at some things called the appropriated fund balances and unappropriated fund balances. And I'm going to go over those with you and tell you I've got some recommendations, I think, how we can shore a few things up. And we've also looked at the teacher's retirement system and employee's retirement system pension rates. Now, it sounds like it's an obscure statistic, but it's really important because those rates seem to be moving upward. And as salaries move upward and the rates move upward, it will put pressure on the school district's budget. So we want to talk about that. Now the next piece of data, you've got a whole bunch of data on one sheet, so I'm going to go through it a little at a time. So I think the first thing we'll do is let's focus in on the top section only, the top third of the page where we're talking about expenses. Now I said we looked at the last five years worth of data on your district, and these are automatic submissions to the State Education Department. They're required. These are so required that if they are not in, you cannot get state aid. So they, they definitely are placed in. They're the result also of your auditor's reports, so they're solid numbers. And you can see over the first column basically where it says approved general fund budget. And this is the growth of your budget since the 15-16 year. So when you see 2016, that means that's June 30th of 16, the end of the school year. So if we look across that page, you'll see the budget's grown, at least an expense budget, from 58 million to 63.6 as of the 1920 school. Now here's the important fact I think that people do not understand about school district budgets. A school district budget is not what you want to spend. A school district budget must be big enough so that no matter what goes wrong, uncalculated or otherwise, you have enough money to cover it. So this means should a, a number of high cost special needs kids come into the district or you end up with some type of tragedy or, you know, bus catches on fire and you need a bus immediately, or things like this, you have enough money in your budget to pay for these things that are incalculable, that you cannot know are going to happen. So the key thing here is that the expenses must be large enough to sustain any cost that this would may incur. And the reason is very simple. You cannot tax more than once and your state aid is frozen. So you have to have enough money in that budget. Now having said that, you'll see there's a modified budget, and that's because you've had no modifications to your budget, which is a real plus for your district. A lot of times districts play all kinds of screwiness with the money. This obviously proves you don't have that. So it's very straightforward. Your budget is very straightforward. That's important, transparency. Then we've got the actual expenditures. Now we want the actual expenditures to be less than the budget expenditures. In other words, we're hoping for the best, Right? but we're planning for the worst. So you want money left over every year. And if you'll notice, other than encumbrances, which are basically bills that can't be paid by June 30th because the invoice hasn't arrived yet, uh, you do have what they call an expenditure variance. It's positive money left over. Now, the interesting thing about this is it has fluctuated a little bit, and we had a down year in the 16, 17 year. But other than that, it's been fairly stable. So in other words, your budget to actual expense ratio is actually very stable, and that's what we want to see. So kudos to the district. The dilemma comes in the middle third, where we, we're, we're trying to come to grips with state aid. Let me explain. So you've got budgeted revenues across the top line, underneath the revenue line. And then if we go down to the modified, it's only been modified once by $100. Could have been a gift to the district. And then the actual revenues, you'll notice, come up short in many years, and that's mostly because of state aid. Your district is known as underfunded in foundation aid. I don't know if you're aware of this. If you've been battling for more state aid for years, this is what the product of this is. In other words, you're hoping to get paid the amount of money that you're due, but the state really hasn't come forward. Now, I'm going to have some good news for you as we look at, at, the, at the prognosis for the future. The state is going to end up fully funding you over the next two years. So you'll, you'll start to see this imbalance start to go away. But most of this is state aid. Now state aid is a tricky proposition, and I'll tell you why. It's very unpredictable in many ways. For instance, you know when you get those state aid runs, you all get them as board members probably, uh, Dr. Graham sends them out to you, 
And they look like they were sheets that were photocopied in April about 30,000 times. You can barely read them. Ever seen them? They're black and white. Those are always wrong. And that's because they're based on data submitted by districts in January, but the state aid numbers aren't due to the succeeding June. So they're an estimate by the state of your state aid. So one of the suggestions I made is we've got to start in our revenue picture, start underestimating state aid a little bit more because those numbers tend to be unreliable. So what we actually have here, if we look at the one called modified to modified summary, there's been a couple years when really uh, what we've had is our revenues were short compared to our expenditures, and we're trying to avoid that into the future. So it's difficult for the state aid uh, right now to, to plan it, but we're going to try and do a better, a better job at it. But the one that's really important, too, I think that's very telling about your district is the next set of numbers called the actual to actual summary. So here we have actual expenditures next to actual revenues. Never mind, regardless of what you budgeted, are you actually spending more than you're taking in? And this is where I think Dr. Graham and Ruby basically kind of wanted to contact me saying, yeah, we are, we're spending more than we're taking in, and we're eating reserves. Is there any way to stabilize this condition? And I think there is. And this happens in a lot of districts. And that's because the wants in a district usually outstrip the, the actual revenues that they have. So they tend to rely on these reserves. And what we want to do is stop the drain of the reserves. Now, also, your assigned appropriate fund balance has been pretty stable, if you'll notice. I'm going to make some suggestions because I think it looks stable on paper, but it's not as stable as it looks because we're starting to tap those reserves, so I think it's, it's presenting a skewed number. But right now, what we're really worried about is how do we stop the drain of reserves? We start budgeting so that we actually uh, have a little safety valve in there in case things go wrong, because I think there's going to be some state funding cliffs in the future. You have some federal grants that you're eligible for, and I think we've got to change how we're using some of those to help you build your reserves. Because after those federal grants go away in about three years, uh, that's going to be another funding cliff for you. So I think we save now to make us make sure we have a better future. So I go to the next page, which is really state aid. And what I've got here on the state aid page is a lot of numbers, but let me just explain to you the highlights. These are all the categories of state aid your district is eligible for. So you can imagine in the business office, it's got to be a lot of paperwork to file for all the state aid. Let's focus in on the first one, foundation aid at the top. Foundation aid is the biggest category of aid, and this is the one you've been underpaid for years. I'd say you have been underpaid in foundation aid since 2007. So you've always been shorted in foundation aid. Now, let's just take a look at some numbers here. If you look at the 21 and, uh, 2021 and 21 22, you'll see there's a bump of foundation aid bringing you into this year by $662,000. You see that? Now, that amount in April was a different number. And the amount a couple months before that was a different number there, too. But now it's the real number. But the problem is you had to build a budget a year and a half before you knew the real number. So, this is what's becoming problematic for all school districts. But let's go to the 22-23 year, and the difference now jumps up to 1,103,000. Everyone see that? What's going on there is the state has finally recognized, the governor has signed into law, and the legislature has passed into the budget law that says they must pay up all school districts that are owed money currently to the amount that they're owed for the current years, for the next two years. So you'll notice there's a $1,103,000 increase over the next two years. You see that? So the good thing there, that's going to help you with that revenue picture we talked about. Because they're finally going to pay you the money they owe you. The shame is, is they're not going to go back and pay you all the money they owe you. They're going to start paying you correctly starting now, next year. Not this year, next year. And they're going to do it for two more years. But my dilemma is, if you'll notice, look at the last two orange numbers. It drops down considerably. And that's because we don't know what your state aid will be then. You will be what they call fully funded. So the big question is, what are they going to pay you? So what we did is we took an arbitrary 2.5%. And the reason we use that number is because all districts that were fully funded in the current year were paid to get somewhere between a 2% increase and a 3% increase. So we took the average at 2.5%. Seems reasonable. We don't want to remember overestimate state aid. 
So that's the foundation picture. So things are looking up temporarily. The next one I want to talk about is we've got your building aid. You can see it down here. If you go down, it's about fifth one down. And you'll see the building aid is dropping, and it's dropping precipitously. Everyone see that? Start to see the building aid. Go across the page, you'll start seeing red numbers. And that's because what's happening is you're paying off debt, and of course now you're planning a new capital project. Now, if you do the new capital project based on the, uh, the parameters we had given the district earlier, we believe you'll simply fill that number in and that will flatten out. So that should help with the revenues. Because you would get building aid on the new project. So we think we can take care of some of that problem. The next set to go down and look at is the one called public high, high cost aid and private high cost aid. These are students with special needs that are profoundly disabled that are in unbelievably expensive programs. Now, you could say to yourself, well, look, we're getting $300,000 or $400,000 in these programs. Isn't that good? Well, I must tell you, it might cost between $800,000 to get $400,000 in aid, because this is only a partial reimbursement. But these children are probably most deserving and most needy among all of us, and therefore the district has obviously mission obligation to take care of them. If we go down even further, you're going to see there's a cluster of aids called software, library, textbook, and so on. And you've had a little dip in, in uh, some enrollment, so it went down a little bit, but we predict looking at your enrollment is going to snap back up, so that should hold stable. That's a per student amount. The next one is yellow. You'll see it says universal pre-K, and you're getting $110,823 as a carrot kind of to help you do a pre-K program. You notice the state really wants you to have a pre-K program, so that now they've boosted the eligibility to 478, so I believe that you will be using that 478 in your pre-K program, but here's the part that's interesting. That money is not part of your general fund when it comes in. There's a special fund that that must go in. For instance, the federal grants will go into the same fund. The name of the fund is the special aid fund. School districts vote on a general fund budget, then there's a special aid fund for federal aid and UPK. There's also a school lunch fund, and there's a capital fund, all used by your district for specific purposes. So in the bottom line, if you look at underneath total aid, I've actually subtracted that aid out because it's not part of your general fund. All right, so I, just so you can see, what the state likes to do is add these aid categories so you end up with a large total, but it's not really your total aid. In other words, it's in a different category. So it, the state looks great, and then uh, you've got to sort it out. So that's your state aid picture. As you can see, we've got it moving along. It's growing a little bit, for perhaps mostly in the next two years. But the next graph is the one I think that uh, uh, Dr. Graham and, and Ruby brought me in on, and this is the use of the reserves. And if you look at that graph, this is actually what's going on so far in the use of your reserves. So I put a line straight up and down in June of 22 where we may end up. And what's actually happening here is, I think as they watched the district's finances over time, they were seeing that the district had a heavy dependency on use of reserves over time, and that the reserves were being exhausted. So what we wanted to do is come up with a plan that would actually fortify the district's reserves, kind of like a live to fight another day type of idea. Now, if you notice the reserves that are listed here, unemployment reserve, the reserve for employee benefits accrued liability, Reserve for debt. By the way, that reserve for debt is supposed to be exhausted by law. Right? That, that, that reserve is supposed to go down. It's required to go down. And of course, the other one is reserve for retirement contributions. We're trying to bolster that up. You see a little plan to move that up a little bit. That's because those, those retirement and pension costs are starting to escalate. And then we've got a capital reserve, which you exhausted in the last capital project. But I want to talk to you about capital reserves for the future. So if we look at the next page, you'll see there's a list of reserves here. And we've got all kinds of reserves in here. The first one is the workers' compensation reserve. You're not required to have it, and you do not have it, and there's no problem in not having it. If you had surplus funds, you could put some in, but it's not like a reserve that's desired that you must have, so that's okay. The unemployment insurance reserve is the next one up. Now, one of the things we talk about when we're talking about exhausting reserves, we should probably also talk about balancing reserves. In other words, is the money in the right spot? So one of my recommendations I'll have at the end of this program is basically that 
I think over next year, probably next June or May, I would transfer some money out of unemployment and I would actually put it into the one that's listed at the second one down there, the yellow one, called the TRS Reserve. I don't have it highlighted, the other it's all yellow. I think you ought to start a TRS Reserve because that pension cost is starting to accelerate pretty rapidly. So that might be a recommendation for next time. But you do have enough money, I think, right now in the reserve for retirement contributions, and that's for what they call ERS employees, non-certified staff. So it would be cleaners, bus drivers, custodians, things like that, who are not certified staff. In other words, they don't belong to the teacher's retirement system. So that's what I would take a look at there. If you notice, you have nothing in the property loss liability insurance reserve, and you're not required to, nor should you have to. This is for districts that really have these types of problems. I've got districts that are clients that, for instance, they have constant flooding and cannot get flood insurance. Okay, so they start a property insurance reserve because they, you know, some creek out there that FEMA hasn't fixed or something yet keeps causing a monitor. Uh, some people actually have some of these reserves for the insurance reserve or the liability insurance reserve or liability reserve because there are claims under the Child's Victims Act. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that's where if uh, any, any student or, or a staff member that ever went to Grand Island, attended Grand Island at any time, felt that they were perhaps sexually abused during any point in their life, they could sue the district. So you have no claim, so there's no reason for a reserve for those right now. You have uh, a minimal tax for your claims, and therefore you have a minimal reserve. And you've got what's known as the Reserve for Employee Benefits Accrued Liability. In the vernacular, we call it EBLAR, because I didn't think we want to keep saying the whole term. So what actually happens here, this is a reserve that's used to uh, pay uh, employees upon severance from the district for sick personal and vacation days. If you'll notice, that reserve has been going down every year. I'm suggesting we start to budget some of that money instead of tapping the reserve. In other words, we start calculating those absences and see if we can add some of those costs to the budget. Because once that reserve is depleted, it will have a huge negative effect on your budget. So we should plan ahead. Now the next three are capital reserves. You'll see you have a small one there that's been exhausted. And then you'll see there's two more that there's nothing there, and that's because you didn't have them. But capital reserves are miraculous reserves. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Capital reserves can actually do a couple of things. You can have a capital reserve for capital construction. You can have a capital reserve for equipment. You can have a capital reserve for the purchase of buses. You can have a capital reserve for the purchase of vehicles and plows and stick rack trucks or lawnmowers. You can have a capital reserve for classroom equipment. And that's also what worries me, not only the loss of the reserves, but you don't have reserves here. I think we ought to build some. Because the cost of those items is escalating rapidly. Only a few years ago, a 67 passenger bus was 100000 It's over 130000 now. So they're becoming very expensive. Now, capital reserve for capital construction. I know you're thinking about a capital project now, but let's think also of the future. The interesting thing about a capital reserve for construction is really amazing because the state actually helps you with this. If you started a capital reserve for capital construction, and let's just say it was a reserve for, I don't know, $5 million for 10 years for capital construction, that we used surplus funds could be put into it. If you did, we'll say, a $10 million project, and you used two million of that capital reserve and left the other three sitting there, you used two of it, you would get aid on the 10 million you spend on a project, of which two is your own money. So you will get aid on your own money plus interest to help you rebuild the reserve. It's a state incentive. So I think that's something we should look for in the future if we're going to continue to do capital projects. School districts across the state are aging, even though they do capital projects, the price of uh, roofs and doors and windows and safety equipment and so on tends to go up. So there's always capital projects going on, but I think we really need a long-range plan. I know that your architects, I was sitting in on a board meeting not too long ago, where they talked about your long-range capital plan. I think we ought to match it with some savings and see if we can do that. But also, you know, trucks need plows, and state rack trucks, and they've got vehicles and pickup trucks, and they've got grounds moving and all kinds of stuff. And you have multiple campuses, so I think we should plan that. You can also have a capital reserve for technology if you wish. For instance, maybe using the Smart Schools Act, you bought a bunch of laptops or iPads or something like that. You have a bunch of 
promethean boards or white boards all over the district. You know, those wear out, and over time you have to replace them. So the big question is, what's the plan? I think one of my jobs has been as your financial advisor is to constantly ask questions. Because remember, this is not just long-range planning. The key to long-range planning is long-range analysis. In other words, we don't want to be thinking five years from now what we would have, could have, should have. We want to start planning ahead. So maybe you want to buy some technology or something five years out. Well, maybe we can plan for that too. Now, you have no reserve for repairs, which is my least favorite reserve. And that's because it's a pain in the neck to use, and it can only be used for repairs. And repairs are non eatable So if you don't want to fix a roof, you want to replace the roof. Because if you fix it, it doesn't usually have a long warranty. But if you replace it, you can get a 15, 20, or 25 year warranty. So, and besides, it's state aid eligible. The state will support the effort to put a new roof on, but the state will not support you repairing a roof. So your best bet for the taxpayers and to get something done is to really uh, put it in capital. Now you've got a reserve for debt. As I mentioned earlier, this is a reserve that's required to be used. And if you'll notice, uh, the amount of this reserve has dropped pretty substantially, and the plan is to keep it dropping. Now, I think this is also a reason for the depletion of the reserves, and I think this is why Dr. Graham and Ruby said to me, hey, what, what are we going to do about this? Well, the big problem we've got here is twofold. One is, is that we're dropping it at a pretty, pretty clip big clip here, so I wish we were dropping it a little smaller. Matter of fact, we've made a recommendation to the district that if we could drop it maybe 100000 less this current year and move it over to two years from now, it would actually ease the burden on the tax gap. The dilemma is using a, a reserve for debt, which is supposed to be used every year, actually reduces the tax liability because what the district is saying is, gee, we don't want to tax for the project or tax for the capital costs. Let us pay for it. Well, what happens is you're running out of money trying to help everybody out. So remember, the goal of the Board of Education, not the goal of the Board of Finance, you're the Board of Education, is to sustain this system. So the idea is to increase its longevity. So one of our suggestions would be, and for your new capital project, we have provided a plan whereby you will actually have a new reserve for debt, and we will drag that reserve for debt out over 15 years to pace it out. This way here, what will happen is you will help the taxpayers, but you will also help the district survive to fight another day. So you can maintain your fund, fund balances in a more stable way. Now at the bottom of this page, there's something that's really kind of interesting and I want to point out to you. And that is this bus purchase ban. See how it says ban bond anticipation note? Now I'm supposed to act as a fiduciary. I don't know, you know my background as a superintendent and business official. Actually, I was even an athletic director for a year and a half, believe it or not. Uh, so I've had every job. I was a principal, I was a teacher, you know, I did all the coaching, the whole thing. But what I do know is, is that cut cash is king. I, you know, I wish I could buy a house cash. Because just think all the money I'd save. Because once you buy a house for 20 years and your mortgage, it's usually double the cost of the house. Same thing with a car. So, what I'd like to do is start experimenting and seeing if we could come up with a plan that we would actually stop buying using bands, bond anticipation notes, to buy buses and start buying one per year more cash, if possible, by seeing if we could get it in a budget. Now, we will have to ramp into this because it's going to have a tax gap impact. It's going to put a jolt on your tax gap, to be honest with you. But cash is king. So instead of paying my firm money to go borrow money to buy your bus, how about you don't pay me anything? We go buy your bus in cash. Then you get your aid over five years as you normally would, plus interest as if you borrow. Therefore, further decreasing the actual cost of the bus to you. So I think we would like to try something like that to try and see if we can work it in over the next couple years, a bus here, a bus there, to see if we can do it. We'll have to do it slowly because you're buying buses at a, at a big rate because you're a larger district. Notice that the cost is eight six eighty five and it goes up to seven six and five. A common trick I play on business officials all the time is, give me a five year schedule for buses, and then some business officials say, well, we're going to spend four hundred thousand a year in buses. So then I say, to be a smarty pants, oh, so we're buying less buses. They say, no, we're buying four hundred thousand. But the cost of the buses are going up. So if we stabilize the cost, you are going to have to buy less buses. So the key thing is, if this is how many buses you need, the price will go up. 
buses are becoming more expensive, and they're becoming what's known as long lead items. In other words, it takes a little longer to get them than it used to before because of the supply chain. So that's something we would recommend too. Now let's go to a couple scenarios here for you. Now this is going to get complicated very quickly, so try and stay with me and try not to get ahead of me. If you could just stand the same page I'm on, I think we'll do better. Okay, because this gets complicated quickly. Are we ready? Okay, here we go. So I have a scenario on the top. Now your last tax increase was 3.2, and I'm just going to keep it at 3.2. No matter what the, the tax cap comes out, we're going to leave it at 3.2 just to make sure that's stable. But you'll get the point as we go on. State aid, slight but stable increase. I showed you that already on the state aid page. Variable transportation aid because of the buses that you're going to be buying. Building aid follows your debt service schedule. I showed you that. The federal aid remains stable. Now when we say federal aid, in your budget, the federal aid line is Medicaid. It's not those federal grants. Those are in a separate budget. The federal grants are in a separate budget. Now your expenditures, we're going to follow your contractual obligations. And remember, you have collected bargaining units, and you're, you actually have to abide by those units, uh, and, and what the races have to be that have been negotiated and so on. I've got no notable change in staff patterns. What I mean by that is, chances are your staff ratio to students is not going to change much. You're going to still need the staff you've got. You're very happy with the staff you have. If people leave, I believe you probably want to Place them and keep the great program going. That's what I think you're going to try and do. Stable ERS and TRS with increased costs. In other words, stable, gentle increase in those costs. Now remember how pension systems work, and this why I mentioned contractual obligations. So let's just use some examples. If I'm going to charge a pension rate against you at a certain rate against your pay, if you get an increase in pay and there's also an increase in the pension rate, then the cost is going to go up a lot greater than if only one of them had moved. In other words, let me give you an example. So let's just say you're making $40,000 a year and I give you a 3% raise, and the pension system used to be at 9%, now it's at 9.5%, you can imagine your cost will go up because you gave the raise at the same time as the pension system. This is what's going on in New York, so you're going to get an increased cost but over time. Now here's what we're doing. Normally what some districts do with the new funds, the new federal funds, the ARPA funds and the CRISA funds, you've been studying those, I know, is what they do is they simply pay people out of federal funds because they're encouraged to do so, and then they hire more people and they supplement their staff. So they do those two things. So this scenario is going to represent that, but this is the revenue side of the scenario. And if you'll notice, look at the total revenues, they're going for about 62, 6 million at the bottom to about 70 million, which is a 12% 12, 12% increase. Everybody see how that works? Okay. Okay, I see it here. Okay. Okay, so now let's go to the expenditures. So to make it easy on you, I carried over our revenues from the previous page on the top. Everybody see it? All right, now let's go, let's go through those expenditures once we get through one of these and the, the, other, the other scenario will be easier. I've divided up your expenses into major categories. General support, instruction, transportation, community service, employee benefits, debt service, and then some other categories. So let's just talk about this quickly. What's in general support? General support would be the superintendent's office, the board's, the board's functions and costs. It would be the business office. It would be the school's attorney. It would be the external auditor. It would be the district treasurer. It would be the district clerk. It would be all the people that work in those offices, all the equipment they buy, all the computers they have, all the copiers they have, all the printing they do. But also a big part is all the cleaning, custodial, and maintenance is in there. Groundskeeping is in there. Supplies, materials, gas for all those folks, uh, materials, cleaning materials, mops, all that stuff, wax, paint, everything is in general support. So we divide it between salaries and other because you have contractual obligations, and we did the same thing with instruction. What's in instruction? It's not just teachers. Your principals are in there, the guidance counselors, the school nurses in there, right? The social workers are in there. Uh, the ELL uh, teachers are in there. Special ed is in there. OCs is in there. So anybody that talks to, works with, sees, or somehow identifies with the educational program, 
is in there, the librarians, guidance, and so on. And we separate those salaries now. Transportation, pretty easy. Bus drivers, mechanics, that bus driver, mechanics, and so on, those are in the transportation section. Salaries and other. Community service, any community programs you put on. And then we have employee benefits for all the employees. If you notice, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar, but if you just look at the salary lines and start adding them up in your head, 3 million, 27 million makes it 30, 2, 32. Then go through the retirement, uh, 35, 36, uh, go through Social Security, 37, 38, 39, workers' comp, 40, health, 49, other, say around 50 million, out of a total budget of 67 million. So almost everything is connected to people. So most of your budget is connected to the employees in some way. And then we look at your debt service schedule. If you look at the debt service schedule going across the page, the principal interest you see it's changing as your old capital project is paid off and therefore leaves room for you to accept a new capital project. And you've got the buses, same thing, interest and principal, and you've got a BOCES capital project in there, but you have zeros in the line called RAN10. And that is really, really important. RAN is a revenue anticipation note. Revenue anticipation note. TAN is a tax anticipation note. You have zero money in there. That's perfect. That means that you have adequate cash flow to fund your district. Every year, you don't have to borrow money to survive. That's wonderful. And I put that in. You can say, well, you can left it out because there's nothing there. But I have to put it in to show you you didn't need it, which is a good thing. And then we have interfund transfers. And your interfund transfers could be for capital outlay or what they call 4408, which would be summer school special ed kids. And then food service, which is your cafeteria program. And then we have your total expenses. So technically, that's what we've got. So the problem we've got here is that the revenues are going up 12%, but the expenses are going up 13.7. Everybody seeing the problem over time? So this is why you would need reserves to keep the reserves so you can fall back on those to make up that difference. Now, the other situation we've got here is some carryover funds. Now, we've actually gone through your entire budget almost line by line this at the end of last year, and we found that you can carry over 3.8 million. But if you notice the next line down, it's the blue line, it goes down to 3 million 766. And that's because a lot of your carryover this year is bigger than your carryover in previous years because of COVID. You didn't have the buses going 183 days a year with all the bus drivers and all the mechanics and all the gas and all the heating and the lighting and the electricity. You didn't have all the cleaning staff going, cleaning everything every single day as if the kids were here. You didn't have a whole bunch of substitutes. You didn't have a whole bunch of people out sick. You didn't have all those expenses. So you got a little bonus year, if you get my drift, in terms of the money you didn't spend compared to other years. All right? Now, if you'll notice, there's red numbers in the 22 budget. See the red numbers? What the district has done is two things. One, if they have used the federal grants, ARPA and CRISA, to supplement. In other words, get some extra staff to help the kids out with summer school programs, after school, and so on. But they've also used the federal monies to ease the burden on the budget. So what has actually happened, those red numbers represent decreases of where the budget would have been for this year had that federal grant not come in those numbers would have all been higher. Everybody with me? It would have been higher. So the federal grant has helped you. But the dilemma is underneath that little blue line, we've got a little orange line, and this is that use of the debt service, which is actually taking money out of the reserves. Now it's supposed to, but you'll notice the volume is pretty good. I wish the volume was like maybe, you know, 50,000 a year instead of 960, and I, I hope maybe we can do a little less than 960 this year because what we want to do is make that last a little bit longer. So we've got that little drain on our reserves going on. Now it's supposed to occur, but I just wish the magnitude was just a little smaller. So now we have the problem with uh, 25 here. See, the dilemma is, is when the federal grants start actually paying for some of these people like they're supposed to help you with, what the feds forgot was, is that what happens when the grant goes away? If these people come back into the budget, they're going to cause havoc with the budget because now they're going to make the budget get bigger faster out of the blue. So we're going to stand the dilemma here. 
So this is the this is really what we want to try and avoid. So I have another plan for how to get around, get around this. But the key thing is, is those red numbers would then make things a little worse as these people came back into the budget. So in other words, you have a great temporary plan, but the long-range plan doesn't gonna, isn't going to work so well. And I can prove it to you. If you look at that, what I call the bottom boxes down there, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff at the bottom. First of all, you've got what the very, very bottom is called the revenue to expenditure difference. And you'll notice it goes from 1.9 million to 5 million. Now, why is that? That's because the district was claiming rep reserves as revenues. And my point would be is you don't need to declare the reserves as revenues unless you actually need them as revenues. And right now, you don't need them as revenues, so we're not going to declare them as revenues. So I think we have to clean that part up. So you, that's called the appropriated fund balance. Now, if you notice, there's an arrow going from that 5215 up and diagonally to a positive number 5215. You do have enough money right now that you can balance that out. But the key thing is, is that what's it going to do to your reserves? Because if you need 5215 to balance the budget, but you can only carry over the blue number of 3.8 million, you will still be short. So we're going to understand what I'm getting at? You will still need more money. Therefore, look at your reserves between 21 and 22. They're going to have to go down. In other words, we're going to have to tap them. So despite the district's best effort to use some of the federal funds to help balance that budget, it's really not quite enough. So we're going to have to use them more. And if you'll notice, look at that reserve line. It actually goes from 3.7 million to 3.1. So as those people come back, it really makes a hit on your reserves, and you really just can't survive. In other words, you're really not gaining anything for long term. Do everybody see where I'm coming? In other words, you're just kind of like a balancing act. But there is a way out. Let's go to the next page, page 9, scenario 2. Now this one, I'm using the same assumptions in the revenue side, but I'm going to change how we do it in the expense side. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to maintain staff in the budget and use the federal money longer until it is exhausted, but to help you out. So in other words, this page 9 is exactly to the two pages previous on the previous revenue page. In other words, I'm doing nothing with your revenues because you cannot change your revenues except for increased taxes. And most districts are into increased tax avoidance as much as possible. So what we're going to try and do is stabilize these revenues the way they are. But let me point out to you, the yellow line across there, we have the 2.66, and it says ERS, unemployment, EBL, debt service. You see that? You can't, we're not going to claim those anymore. In other words, the district's going to have to stop taking things out of their reserves. Instead, we want to build them instead of de deplete them. Because you'll have nothing to fall back on when the federal funds are gone. So this is going to be our new plan. So if you go to page 10, here's the plan. So I brought over the revenues again, just the same. But now you'll see there's actually a huge box right over here inside that, that spreadsheet. Let me see if I can bring that up on the screen here. Happier. Right there. And what we're, I suggest we do is we do more supplanting with the federal funds rather than just supplementing. Supplementing is good, that's the major purpose of the funds, but there is no uh, adverse uh, cause that you cannot start supplanting. Now, what's the difference between that other than spelling? Supplementing means you're going to take the federal money, you're going to add, we'll say, staff to your book, to your, your school district with the federal money. It's supposed to be a temporary fix because of COVID to bring the kids back up to snuff because of all the turmoil that occurred while the kids were on remote learning. That's a good thing. The problem with that is, while the feds are trying to help you with that, there's a real life consequence. And that is, is after that money's gone, what do you do with those people? You say, okay, thanks, goodbye. I don't know of a school district that has ever jettisoned people like that. So the big thing is, you may end up absorbing them into your budget. So what else can we do? Well, my suggestion is we do more supplanting. Now, what's that mean? That means what you would do is you could pay people using the federal grants money to actually sustain your budget over time, and then take their salaries and help you build fund balance. To cut to the chase, if you'll notice, look at the numbers on the bottom line. We have the 1950, $1,950,000. That five million, if you scoop back two pages, you'll see it's a different number. And the four million after that, and so on, 
so that technically speaking, what I would do is I would lighten up the load on your budget in terms of building fund balance with that federal money. Because once the federal money is gone, you don't want to be in a catch-22 where you try to do the right thing and you have no money left. So what we want to do is look at the reserve line. It goes from 3.9 to 4.6. And that would be bringing the people back. So what you would actually do, you'll see I have depressed the total expenses temporarily to build fund balance. And therefore, you could build up your reserves over the next two to three years. And that's all you have is two to three years. So you've got a whole bunch of things happening at once that I've talked about so far. Remember I told you you're going to get a big boost in state aid over the next two years? What happens in the third year? Go on. You're going to get a big boost in federal aid with one category, the DECRISA, for three years. What happens in the fourth year? Poof. Gone. The ARPA, or the, uh, ARPA money, four years after that, poof, gone. So here's your chance to actually build your fund balances using those funds at the same time while you are a supplement. And this will help build your reserves, and I believe it will help Grand Island live to fight another day. So it will stop the diminishment of these reserves over time. That's the plan. On the next page, I've actually tried to summarize how the reserves coming, come out using the two scenarios as a summary. So if you'll notice, just look at 2026 in each one, you'll see the, the bottom plan, my scenario two, that usually supplement of the federal funds, but actually put you in better shape. So what we've got is some things to do and some things not to do, some things to continue doing, and some things not to do, but continue doing. So I think you'll be in better shape using this. So here's my recommendations in a nutshell. Page 12. We've got to track track expenses. Uh, here's what I'm going to say. This is going to be a little tough sometimes, I think, but you have to realize this. If we don't need to spend it, don't. Okay? It's nice to make everybody happy, but we can't, we can't, if it isn't budgeted, don't buy it. If it isn't an emergency, don't have it. If it isn't really required, don't do it. Right now, we've got a whole bunch of things that have become part of the Grand Island culture that would be considered, quote, required to continue. But if you start something new, you may have to practice selective abandonment, get rid of something. So the idea is we've got to tighten up some of these expenses. So you've got to watch that carryover, A. B, please keep in mind that when you are actually planning your budget with Ruby and, and, and Dr. Graham, what's going to actually happen here is you're going to be planning your budgets probably starting next month. You're going to pass a budget in May that won't take effect until the following July that has to last till the following June 30th and still bring carryover money, and you've got to do it five years in a row. Okay? It can be done. Okay, we've got to maintain adequate cash flow. So far, so good. So we've got to make sure we're doing that. And then we've got to look at cost reductions. In other words, one of the things I said, remember I mentioned about the buses? I think we ought to examine the buses, see if we can save you a couple bucks on buses. All right, get you more aid and have the bus cost less. But if you have to cut things, or you have to trim things, or you have to make tough decisions, always, a, I'm, an, I'm an educator, I mean, I'm your finance guy, but I'm an educator. We gotta do it far away from the kids. I think today's board meeting was a perfect example of how important these kids are to this community, how important these kids are. So you gotta be careful. But you've also gotta take a look at attrition and breakage. So let me give you an example. Well, if Rick was working for you, and Rick decides to retire, quit, or whatever he does, moves out of town, in the old days, you would probably say, well, who are we going to get to replace Rick? My suggestion to you now is, do we need to replace Rick? Would be the question I would ask. Now, it might be you don't need to replace Rick. Or maybe you need to replace Rick, but not the same way as Rick's working now. Or maybe you don't need a Rick anymore, but you need an Ed over here so you can reallocate the resources. So I think we've got to start thinking about attrition and breakage to try and save some money. Uh, I think what we've got to do is get a long-range financial plan on those buses. I really would like to work a schedule up with that. But I've got to tell you, you are looking, every school district in the state of New York is looking at a fiscal cliff in the year 2024. Every district. So you're not alone. Number two, reevaluate reserve and fund balances for sustainability and liabilities. I think you've got to build a TRS reserve. That pension system is going up. So one of the first places that would put some money in reserve would be there and capital problem. You've got to build that T -E ERS because those reserves are starting to cost, or those pensions are starting to cost a good, a good chunk of change because it's having salary increases. C, you've got to look at a capital reserve. I think you're going to be looking at a capital project probably every couple of years if you're a smart district 
There's no reason that you have to do $50 million projects. These I have districts that are doing $90 million projects because they waited so long to do everything. So I think we can come up with plans that you can do them more frequently, but they don't have to be as large. And we can actually keep the cash flow fairly flat. Uh, I think we'd have to take a look at the capital reserves for other things, maybe vehicles, equipment, technology, or something like this in the future if we have the funds for them. I think the longevity of the federal grants is going to be problematic for you and every other school district in the state of New York. Uh, I've tried to work with our clients now to use them very prudently, but I've, I've got to tell you, as I gain new clients, I find out some errors have been made and they're way off on a tangent someplace and it's going to cost them cash, so we've got to be careful. But there will be federal funding cliffs in 24, 25, and 25, 26, no matter what happens. No matter what you do, those cliffs will be there because those grants will be gone. And I would use the supplement and supplant method with the grants. Next, your state aid. Remember, your, your foundation aid is going to increase slightly, but then ebb out, basically. It's going to kind of flatten right out to a very low number. And I think so that's got to be taken into consideration. I think we have to take a look at the pros and cons of a building project using the new debt service fund funds. I think we've come up with a plan that you can actually do it, and it will work. It will flatten out your debt service and your aid, so I think we can eliminate that problem. But you're not going to have a huge capital project unless you run a tax impact, at least on the preliminary one we've been talking about. And then you've got to monitor the tax cap. The tax cap is actually there for a purpose. Every time you pass a resolution, whether it's your budget, capital project, by a bus, no matter what you do, the words, and levy the tax there too, is in the resolution. What you've been doing is using your treasury and not collect the tax. That cannot go on forever because you're going to run out of the money. So I think we have a plan to actually stop the flow of those reserves. Are there any questions I can answer from the board? John, the park so yeah, it's I think the only way you got the only thing you can do right now at this point is two ways. If if we're to tax avoiding, then what we have to do is we have to do more supplanting with the federal money. That's it. That's what you're looking at. Yeah. Well, yeah. If, even if you stop the growth, it would be a big help. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Right. And that's that's the magic question. Right. Is we need a budget that is going to um, realize that if we want to grow reserves and not use reserves, and then we can't increase revenues. Right. So we have to somehow find savings. You got to find savings. Now remember, savings occur in a couple ways. One is through the supply of the federal funds. That would be one. But the other one is stopping the rate of increase. Okay. And you know you got an inflationary trend now, so it's a big, big chance to take a look at some things. But remember, the idea is growing reserves is not just so you have a whole bunch of reserves and you never spend. The idea is the plan. So that technically speaking, let's just say you wanted to buy an eighty thousand dollar plow for the snow plow or something, you had to put it in a budget and raise taxes for it. You would have already saved for it over time, so you would have equipment replacements. Make sense? Yeah. 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 And then you Reduce all cost. <laughs> Reduce all cost. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, exactly. But that's the you're you're right though. Uh, it's the constant discussions you will you will continue to have. Absolutely. But remember, when you trim your budget, if you trim fund balance, you're going to trim the reserve. So you, it's got to be something real, right? Any other questions or comments? I just want to mention one thing to mention multiple times about the debt service and the planned use of that that was planned and voted on in the capital project that's finishing up um, so it's, it's not something that was unknown uh, I think all the implications of it uh, were not forthcoming and we're realizing things and uh, Rick is helping us with what is currently happening and how it moves forward in the future but it was planned that is correct. She's correct. Yeah, the, the key thing I think the use of monies like that is, is simply to uh, use the monies over the same period of time as the amortization schedule for the project rather than advance it. Any other questions? Okay, everybody take out a sheet of paper, numbers one to ten. I'll start with the test. <laughs> Thank you for
very much. It's been a pleasure working with all of you so far, and I really look forward to a bright future with all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Timms, and feel free to head back. I know you have a good one. Thank you very much. Drive safe. for the 2022-2023 school year. Those electives are blog writing. Um, and to teach or not to teach, is Shakespeare still relevant today, which is more of a modern day view on the relevance of Shakespeare in today's society. So these items are for your review, or if you decide to take action tonight, you may choose to do so. Yeah, um, it looks like we're looking for a motion to approve item A. Do I have a motion for A? It says a uh, motion to approve. To approve the two electives. Yeah. And the second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carries 7 0. And then B is just for your information. It's our, I've decided to establish a monthly curriculum and instruction and professional development report. So that is our report for November. Thank you. That brings us to personnel and instructional. If I could have a motion to approve PI1 through PI4, please. I'll motion. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. And start to get serious. Thank you. I did not see that. Uh, personnel non-instructional, if I can have a motion to approve PNI 1 through PNI 3, please. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 6 0. And moving on to finance with Dr. Harris. Alright, I'm going to keep this quick. Um, the two items on the agenda for Absolute equipment is coming from the athletics department. It is a shredder. Uh, and then in reference to budget transfers over 15000 that pertains to the capital project, um, you will probably see one more in reference to the capital project. We have some things we're finishing up now, but that is all for the building now to be submitted by the cost reports. So it's just the movement into the right correct account. If I could have a motion to approve A and B, please. I'll motion. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. Thank you. 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 Thank lovely presentation there. Um, and then you also have the treasurer's report uh, on here for your information and the facility usage schedule of these. Um, we met as a committee um, and I think we had two meetings, maybe three, just to kind of go through where we currently were and where we would like to be in reference to a fee structure. Uh, we did reach out to multiple districts. All of that information is in there. So it's just informational right now for you to review. I'm not going to deep dive into it, but um, it will be on the next board meeting uh, for a bit of further discussion and then uh, direction or action. Can I ask one question? Sure. So <clears throat> for the new information, the says hourly rate, was the old information up? Rate or was so the old information was an hourly rate. 
I would also say, though, for the old information, the only people that seem to, or groups that seem to be charged was uh, like dance in the auditorium and the field usage. So we've had these rates there for a while, um, but they weren't being really charged. Oh. So that includes cab, gyms, um, all those different areas. So what we did was we tried to take into consideration um, Grand Island residents, right, taxpayers, uh, keeping that into consideration, and this being something that would now be introduced to them as, hey, this is the fee requirement for the, for the utilization, um, as well as doing an upcharge for the non Grand Island. And there's, the committee is still talking about certain aspects, right, because the question is, what's the Grand Island, what's not, how do you differentiate between that? So there's more pieces to still be worked through, but um, the committee felt comfortable with these numbers in this aspect and then continuing to build on um, uh, the background. Go ahead. Looking at the first line of high school, middle school, gymnasium, and block and shower facilities, our rate went from forty-five to seventy-five dollars an hour. We're not going from ten dollars to sixty-five dollars an hour. So our hourly rate is dropped. So I, I would assume that we're yes, it's the hourly rate has dropped, but we're actually going to charge the hourly rate. So now, right now, there's a rate, but nobody's paying the rate. So the revenue being received is zero. So to say to someone you want to use this starting, let's say, January 1st, and it's $55 or $75 or $45.60, um, just seemed like it was going to be a bit of an uproar. I, and, and that's why the continuing discussion, like just providing the board with the information and then getting some thoughts from that, I, I can always bring it back to the committee. So the old information was a flat thing, not a they were paying $45 an hour. The nonprofit? I'll confirm. I, I feel it was hourly. I have to look at the actual website online. So hold on one. No, that's right. I'm just looking at it. I mean, you know, I rate up from $45 to $75 an hour, then $10 to $65. So we dropped it. The next slide is dropped. Over one. The new information. Yes. So we have record of any of the uh, <coughs> the money we collected for rentals. Yes. For the year. Yes. I would like to look at that. Okay. Would you like to know the groups as well? Uh, if it's easy. Huh? If it's easy. Okay. okay. Not that okay. Okay. I don't want to spend hours on that. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, moving on to special education, it looks like uh, we need a motion for A and B. Was there anything to ask, Cheryl? Um, just the two program recommendations for um, letter A and letter B for CPSC and CSC and the All right. We can have a motion for services A and B, please. A second. I'll second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carried 7 0. That brings Thank us you. to the superintendent's report with Dr. Grant. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for your interest in our uh, district and for people that are here. Uh, we appreciate you and thank you for uh, being here to learn more about our district. Uh, for this report, I will skip many of the slides for the interest of time. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead to the test to stay. And I just want to make sure that the community knows that our Board of Education adopted a resolution at the November 8th uh, meeting to support and encourage our local health department to move forward with the test to stay strategy. As you already know, we are the only school district in Erie County selected to participate in this pilot program. And of course, it's in partnership with the Erie County Department of Health. As everybody knows, the test to say strategy is designed to significantly reduce the number of students who are excluded from school 
due to being identified as a close contact to someone who was positive at school. The Test Safe program would allow for a student identified as a close contact to be tested daily before school. If the student is negative, the student would be allowed to attend school for that day. So this uh, next page, uh, and all the board members have a copy at your seat, uh, indicates uh, the first week uh, from December 6th to December 13th. As you can see, the first week <clears throat> from the 6th to the 10th, we did not have any positive cases and all the tests uh, were negative. And then today we did have a positive case. So that's listed here in the chart. Uh, 15 total tested, 14 negative, and one positive. So overall, uh, over the six days, we've had 117 tests. 116 of them were negative, and we had uh, one positive case. Does the board have any questions about that information? So, okay, so first day 23, I'm assuming these are the same chunks of the same kids. So for December 6th, yes. So we had 23 students across the entire district tested. Sure. So some students had uh, the quarantine ended for some of those days, so the numbers do change. And it's also important to know that some, even though the numbers have gone down, some new students are being tested, uh, even though some have fallen off of the quarantine. Okay, and this was uh, Tuesday, December 6th, another option for parents. So this was important to note that it's optional to participate in the program. Students could also stay home, you know, parents could choose to have their child stay home and be quarantined yes. during this time period as, as well. Yes, so it's totally optional, it's an opt-in. Some parents, you know, I, we've gotten tr uh, really good feedback from the parents I'm looking at our principals. Uh, the parents who have had their children participate have been thrilled to have this opportunity. But some parents may continue to stay, uh, have their children stay in quarantine, and some families are also considering to be vaccinated. So there's three options with the test to stay. And this is for the school day. This doesn't involve, I know when I was with the uh, legislative meeting, the last legislative meeting, and advocating for this test to stay, it said that it would not include that for school activity. So the only way to be able to participate in those still is if a child was vaccinated, correct? Or Sure, so right, this pilot program does not, it's only for the school day. Uh, so uh, if, if a child is uh, participating in test to stay, but they also are in a sport or an extracurricular activity, it's really, a, it ends up becoming a modified quarantine for that family. So they're able to come to school if they're negative, but they still go home and continue their quarantine uh, outside of school. Is it possible? Is there anything that Say is not the case. I can't, I can't hear you. Can't hear you. So, is there any that change that the students sports and answer activities? Yeah, absolutely. Right now, this is just a pilot program for Erie County. Uh, Monroe, if all the suburban districts in Monroe County are participating in tests say without a pilot. So, their Department of Health decided to move forward. They accessed over 750,000 tests and they're for all of the suburban districts in Monroe County. The only district not participating is the Rochester City Schools. To your question, I will double check to see if those students are allowed to do extracurricular activities during their test to stay. I'm not sure what Monroe is doing, so I'll have to read up on that and get that information for you. But to this, to this end, if Erie County moves forward, we will of course become, you know, be, become activating our superintendents to advocate for uh, you know the extracurricular and, and sport activities to be included in test this day, but right now it's not. Any other questions about that? And so the last uh, slide I do want to share with you is I have spoken to the superintendent of the Rush Henrietta School District. They are a week ahead of us in Monroe County, so. Um, his district, uh, they uh, conducted 500 tests, and there were 11 positive cases uh, that, that they have identified. So again, you know, we've talked a lot about the fact that um, we believe that 98% of the students who are part of 
uh, of quarantine end up being healthy during that time. So right now, I think we hope that Erie County will look at the data from Grand Island, but also consider the data in Monroe County when they move forward to make a decision if this should grow and continue outside of a pilot. Any questions about that? Okay. So the rest of the slides are there for your, you know, consumption. You can see that, you know, I've been including a lot of photographs of our students engaged in various activities. Uh, there are some slides here about test the state and uh, other activities uh, throughout our district over the last time we were together at the board meeting. But just in the interest of time, I'll let you review that. I know it's online. This this, this document. Any questions for me? Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the Board of Education report, uh, the SAVE plan is attached, and we also have a liaison report for the high school PTA. Did you want to comment on that, Jay? No, just there for your information. Okay, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the public comment session, general items not included on this agenda. Um, we do have several people signed up for this. Um, at this time, the public comments are invited from those individuals who desire to address the Board of Education on any topic which is um, on the agenda. Residents who have previously, I'm sorry, it is, yes, general items for general items. Uh, residents who have previously signed up will be recognized by the President when speaking. Please identify yourself first. Speak clearly and loudly enough for everyone in the room to hear you. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to no more than three minutes, to appoint a spokesperson if a concern is a group concern, um, and if necessary or desired, you may supplement your verbal presentation with reports. Personal comments toward a member of the community, staff, or Board of Education member will not be considered appropriate. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Jim Mulhaney from Mulhaney from Mulhaney. Okay. Um, Justin Schultz. Oh, this is about garbage because that, just seeing that board compare those, those uh, numbers that you guys are dealing with with our budget, I mean, you got, you got your hands full, big time. Uh, and obviously, you're going to need that five million dollars a year that our kids are going to try to earn by having to wear a mask and having to do this quarantine. It, it's funny, like, like you, you, <laughs> the numbers that Henrietta shows and that we show. It doesn't show that there should be more tests to stay. It shows that quarantine is ridiculous. It's it's ignorant. The, you know, 11 positive kids out of 500 kids. Just let them go. <laughs> like, I mean, that's, that's one, what is it, 1%, one and a half percent? Quarantine is, it, it's ridiculous. It's unfair. And it's been like that. If the numbers have, I think the numbers have been like that for, right, 1%, 2% of all. We quarantined 498 kids as of the last meeting or something. And there was 2% of them maybe that tested positive. We're worried about 2% of kids. They're, all these kids are missing es extracurriculars now, missing 10 days of school with their friends for a 2% chance that they have COVID and that even at their age group, they're not even, they're not even, they're hardly affected. You, can, you guys are, you know, this is unbelievable what this board does. And it's, it's not the board, it's, it's the whole idea of, of everything. Like, a quick, all right, one quick thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, public Health Law, Section 16, uh, Governor Cuomo's favorite uh, um, strong arm uh, public health law, um, states uh, within 15 days of notice given uh, that the opportunity to be heard and to present any proof that such a condition or activity does not constitute a danger to the health of the people will be given. Um, I have no idea what the penalties are for a district eliminating mask mandates and quarantine mandates, except for losing $5 million in funding, of course, which obviously is extremely important to our district because it seems like we're out of money or running out of money. So, um, But during that 15 days, and you're allowed to speak, let's say you say our, our district says, 
there's no, we're not going to do mass anymore. This is ridiculous. Quarantine shows that it's, it's useless. Our kids, you know, they might be sick. They're, they're, not, they're not getting hospitalized. This is an emergency on Grand Island. We're not going to put our kids through this anymore. Um, it doesn't make any sense anyway. 30 seconds. And they, uh, when you're given that opportunity uh, to demonstrate that optional masking is not a danger, you can simply present current COVID information from Broward County School Districts in Florida where masks haven't been mandatory since November 20th. The figures prove beyond a doubt that optional masking poses less danger than masking and is actually safer than masking. Broward County School District is the sixth largest school district in the country with a 256,000 student population, the same size as the city of Buffalo. GI has 2,800 students approximately. Can we please just a couple seconds? I won't go on long, it's all garbage. This, um, Sorry, we have to since since November 20th, Broward County so School District has averaged less than 10 cases a day. 256,000 kids, 10 cases a day. The size of Buffalo, 10 kids a day. Yeah. Sir, your time's up. But nobody wants to hear what you guys say. It, it, it's 10 cases a day for 256,000 people. Like, they're doing something right that we're doing wrong. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Um, I just want to talk about two boarding meetings ago. Uh, you had brought in two administrators from BOCES to explain your job and the board's role. Thank you for the clarification, but I do see a little bit, um, I see it a little bit different. Uh, as a nurse, my job is also to follow orders as well. I am to act in accordance with the doctor's direction. Of course, when doctors place an order, there's a check system in place for safety. First, the doctor reviews his order, pharmacy verifies it, uh, and the third check is the nurse. Yet, if the order that is implemented neg negatively affects the patient, um, do you know who's most responsible out of those three? It would be the nurse, because I'm the one who's carrying out the order. And I am the last line of defense for the patient. It is not only my job to follow orders, but to question them if they seem appropriate. Dr. Graham, you and the board are the last line of defense for our students. It may be your job to implement orders, but it's equally important to question those orders. Right now, everything is very fluid with things changing daily, and it would be inappropriate not to question things. An example is how um, recently two districts responded differently to mass breaks that came into question. One district um, wanted more clarification but was willing to follow the guidelines, while another stated that because they did not see mass breaks listed in the new guidelines, they would continue the humane act of allowing mass breaks for students. Orders were questions and decisions were made in the best interest of students. So sometimes you can make decisions um, that go against certain um, guidelines. Um, nurses are also the first line of defense because when we see a patient suffering physically, mentally, or emotionally, it's my job to advocate for the patient and report to the doctor what they are experiencing. You are also the first line of defense for the students to report adverse effects, struggles they are facing, and needs that they have. Much like um, it is best for the nurse to report the problems to the doctor, it, because it's a credible source, it's best for sometimes the school districts to come and be able to present the problems to the state on what the kids are experiencing. This is why I feel it's so necessary for schools to take the initiative in helping students with mental health. Although it's important to take steps on keeping students in school, um, canceling assemblies on drug and alcohol education seems counterproductive when the overdose rate for New York has increased 38% in the last year. It's not 38%, it's increased 38% in the last year. I've currently been working with administrators, teachers, and social workers in my district in creating a partnership with a local mental health advocacy organization where they will initiate an eight-week mental health program pushing into the classrooms, um, no assemblies required, uh, beginning with a pre-survey uh, pre needs assessment, then tailoring the program to the students um, and what needs they have, then they finish with a post-assessment where they offer the students more services. Um, so they can offer counseling, mentorship, and peer support programs. Um, I believe early detection and intervention is key because hospitals are becoming overwhelmed with mental health needs. Um, they're either diverting patients or sending them away, and students have nowhere to turn. Ten and seconds. then they will fall back on the schools. So it will become the school's responsibility. So planning ahead is crucial um, because what we witnessed in Michigan recently 
um, is going to become all too familiar, as we know in La Corifolian, Batavia, and today, the Sweet Home. Time is up. Thank you. Next, we have Jennifer America. Hi, Jennifer America. U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murphy said young people in America are experiencing an alarming and widespread mental health crisis and that systematic change is needed in order to tackle the issue. He added, it would be a tragedy if we back, beat back one public health crisis only to allow another one to grow in its place. But are we even beating COVID? Grand Island is one of the highest vaccinated area in Erie County, yet we experienced one of the highest confirmed cases in Erie County recently. Our children are still getting COVID, no matter masks or not masks. Are the potential risks of these masks worth it? Chances are the majority of children, if not all, in our school have had COVID, regardless if it was confirmed or not. Instead of our state staffing hospitals, providing them resources and utilizing effective treatment, they are trying to control something that they can have no control over because COVID isn't going away. Our children are silently and loudly crying for help. Teen suicide attempts among girls have increased 50% from 2019. There's been several school threats throughout Western New York lately. The test to stay program is shameful. While I appreciate that you want our children in school, the discrimination and the lack of science behind the rules of this pilot program is just absurd. When you and the state claim that your policies are strictly based on science, then tell us how is it okay that a student who has been tested negative daily can attend class but not attend their sports or activities. That is not science. That is punishment and discrimination based on their medical background. When you introduce discrimination in our school walls, you create bullying and leads to hostile environment. There's no justification to school excluding children who have been proven to be healthy from extra extracurricular activities because we know that activities are equally essential to our children's development and well-being. And again, we know vaccinated students and staff are getting COVID too. I demand you implement policies that are consistent, equitable, fair, and appropriate to all students based, because no discrimination should be tolerated. I also would urge you to request the state to deny any COVID vaccine requirements for our children to attend school. If the path of these COVID mandates continues, you will continue to lose students. Because us parents are done with this, these mandates on our kids that are causing so many issues. Enough is enough. Less students means less state aid. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole Vacanti. Nicole Vacanti. Superintendent and board members, did you know that each COVID test swab, whether rapid or PCR, is dipped in a hazardous substance called ethylene oxide? This is a colorless gas or liquid used to make other chemicals and used as a sterilant. It is listed on the right to know hazardous substance list because it is cited by OSHA as a carcinogen, mutagen, and teratogen in humans. OSHA states that all contact should be reduced to the lowest possible level and when any skin contact occurs, one is considered to be overexposed. By our students getting tested through both nasal passages on a consecutive basis with the PCR test swab for the virus, that would be considered inhalation and skin contact. The first aid treatment that OSHA lists for this type of contact is immediately remove the individual from exposure, immediately wash the contaminated skin with large amounts of water and soap, Remove such persons from exposure and seek medical attention immediately. Acute contact or exposure to ethylene oxide, which includes this consecutive test to say option, can severely irritate and burn the skin, irritate the nasal passages and throat, cause frostbite, headaches, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, itching, a skin allergy, along with twitching and seizures. High or repeated exposure, which is consecutive testing, including the test to say option, may damage the nervous system, can irritate the lungs, and higher and longer exposure can cause a buildup of fluid in the lungs, 
causing pulmonary edema, which is a medical emergency. I ask you, board members and superintendent, have you made the students and parents aware of this known carcinogen on the swab that is being inserted into their nostrils? Are you going to provide each parent of the child who has not been inoculated with the COVID-19 shot and who is required to get daily testing during the test to stay option with the ingredient insert that comes in the package of the PCR swab or with the New York State Department of Health hazard sheet and its effects? Any said person has a right to know about the hazards that they are being exposed to under the New York State Right to Know Law, the Federal Occupational and Safety and Health Administration, and the Hazard Communication Standard. OSHA requires anyone who would be exposed to this carcinogen be provided with a copy of the OSHA Ethylene Oxide Standard. Again, are you providing this to parents and students now that the test to stay option has been implemented? As we know, the test pilot program through the district, with a partnership through the unreasonable Erie County Department of Health, is only being utilized for any student identified as a close contact who has not been inoculated with the COVID-19 shot. 30 seconds. Close contact, which is school exposure, including the bus, is considered the great team, greater than 15 minutes with less than three feet from one another. As we see in here that the efficacy of the Moderna Pfizer J&J has dwindled immensely, hence the booster, why isn't the test to stay option being offered or mandated to such students who were in close contact and have been inoculated? Superintendent and board members, how can this not cause great concern to you? Those students who have received the full dose of the COVID shot, who will still have full capability, possibly with even a higher rate of shedding and spreading the virus to students that have or haven't received the COVID-19 shot, I still see. attend school on a daily basis and have no testing or quarantine mandates imposed on them. As I, I as a nurse, encourage you to take a step back and reevaluate this process that you are imposing on those who haven't gotten the COVID-19 shot. It is pure discrimination. You know it, the Erie County Department of Health knows it, and we all know it. Time's over. And we know that you are getting money for our children, so, uh, and you will see a max exodus of children up. once this shot up. mandate comes yeah. down.
Discrimination is the unjust or prejudi uh, prejudicial treatment of different categories to which they belong or are perceived to belong, especially on the grounds of medical choice. This Texas State pilot is pure discrimination against the uninoculated students. You all know this and the ECDOH knows it and there is no denying. It is full disclosure that when the district accepted funding from the American Rescue Plan, you received at least $3,700 per student to keep our children muzzled during the school day. 30 seconds. Superintendent, as the evidence shows in your compliance to these tyrannical mandates, our children appear to be just a dollar sign to you and money in your pocket. We taxpayers pay your salary, and your school board members were voted in by us and work for us. And hundreds of us feel you aren't speaking up on our behalf for our children in the school district. So we ask when this test to stay pilot is over after this much, this month, how much money will be will you be taking from the state to continue the discrimination against the students and families who choose to not receive the COVID vaccine? Five seconds. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Helen Good evening, Colleen Huff. Um, to start with, again, I know you guys are up against a lot of different rules, and I understand that the test to stay was in place as a way to at least try to keep the kids in school. Um, I still disagree with it being discriminatory the way it is against those that are vaccinated and those that are not. I want to speak today more about what I've spoken about in the past, and there's now proof of what we're doing to these kids is it's causing mental illness. Their, their physical health is no longer a problem. We are at an actual emerging youth mental health crisis. There was a Surgeon General released a 53-page report learning that symptoms of depression and anxiety have doubled during the pandemic with the 25% of youth experiencing depressive symptoms and 20% experiencing anxiety. Among teenage girls, suicide attempts are up a shocking 51%. We know the effects of social media and, on, and the internet on mental health in developing girls. We forced them to continue a lot of their socializing online during the, the pandemic. And then they're wondering why they're having trouble and issues. The other thing that is happening to a lot of these children is with this test to stay, yes, they can go to school, but their after school activities are, are not happening the way they used to, and they're not allowed to go into them. There are cases of children committing suicide because of that because they can't continue to do their after-school activities the way they're used to, because of the adaptations that have been made, because of the masking and the social distancing, is causing them to not participate because it's not the same. And I just ask you to continue fighting for our children. You are our voice for our kids. And I know that you're trying to get some logic behind this, and I know that you guys are up against a lot of illogical things, but just like what's happening in some of these counties that have turned around and said to, the, to our governor, no more, we're done. This is what we need you guys to continue fighting for us. And I know that the, that the superintendents wrote a letter asking for the proof and, the, and when this is gonna end. I don't know what that response has been. I would love to know if you heard something back, but we need you to continue fighting against this illogical push and discrimination to force everyone into a vaccine that someone decided is supposed to help. But if you look at the numbers, everyone I know that's gotten sick in the last month is fully vaccinated. It's not the unvaccinated friends of mine, it's the people that are vaccinated. There is no proof and we are discriminating. We are teaching our kids discrimination still, even with this test to stay. You're not testing the kids that are vaccinated also. And I don't understand why. There is total breakthrough with a lot of this for people. And I just feel that we, this is the time for we as you as our as our board to start to start to stand up a little bit more for the kids. I am terrified for the mental health of our younger children. Um, my kids are a little bit older, but even what has affected them, their seconds. their normal socialization in high school has been none. That you know they finally got a dance this past year was the first time in two years. So I appreciate the what you've done so far, and please keep fighting. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to Committee of the Whole. Items and information for the round table beginning with Glenn. I got nothing. Okay. I'm all set, thank you. Okay. Uh, 
it was just nice to see all the scholars and the athletes tonight and see them acknowledge them for all their hard work that they had to push through to get through where they are. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, enjoy your family time. Um, I would just like to uh, wish everyone a Merry Christmas and uh, note that there is a legislative legislative survey that I'll be sending to the Erie County School Boards if anyone wants to weigh in on priorities. Feel free to complete it. It's in your email. And that brings us to... Right, I'm all set. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, Jessica, Jessica Hutchins, um, Sue Marston, Jay Grover, and myself, um, we had a, a reconvening um, wellness committee meeting. Um, so it was nice to uh, get back and report out. I also want to say that uh, Catholic Charities is our new agency that we will be um, contracting with, and they are going to be starting in our district one of the Tuesdays in January. So we actually have another agency to help one of them help our children. So, very excited to announce that. So happy holidays, everybody. Mm -hmm. I have stuff. Um, so just a couple of items. Cheryl said I have two minutes. So just a couple of items. Um, we are at the tail end of our FEMA request, which is for the professional plastics, the large ticket item uh, areas, and it does look that we will be granted that funding source, so that will be um, some revenue we receive back uh, that we weren't fully sure about. And uh, as the rules change, if anything else qualifies, we will continue to apply for those things to receive uh, money back. Uh, we are also at the tail end of the Sidway Desney grant. Um, we are doing our submission tomorrow, so I'm hoping in the coming weeks they'll actually just wire us the money instead of waiting for a check. Um, the Grand Island Library reached out to us in reference to them having a large sum of funds. They cannot access the same type of investment accounts that school districts can, so they are seeing if there's a way to partner uh, with the school district to open a specific investment account for the library to allow their money to grow uh, a little bit better. That is allowable, so school districts do do that and I'm investigating that a bit more. Anything we can do to give back to the community and really help the library out, I think, is a uh, collaborative and supportive nature of the entire community. So I will have forthcoming information in January about that, as well as January providing a BOCES first half of their capital project is completed, so you'll have informational update for that. I will not run through it at the upcoming presentation, uh, but I will provide that as well as our own update since our capital project is ending. Happy holidays. Thank you. And Dr. Green. Yes, thank you. You know, uh, for our board and our community, I just want to take a moment to thank our transportation department for their excellent work uh, past Wednesday as we experienced a bus accident on the 290. Uh, last Wednesday, four of our students who have special education needs who were being transported back to the island from their off-island school, um, they were involved in an accident. There was another vehicle that slid on the slippery uh, 290 road conditions. Uh, that vehicle was in the right lane and it hit our bus uh, and our bus was in the center lane. Uh, the car hit our bus on the passenger side, causing the bus to spin and slide into the guardrail. Both impacts were measurable and caused significant damage. Thankfully, our students are safe and uninjured, and uh, we're so grateful to our bus driver, Wendy Truesdale, who really did a remarkable job keeping her students safe. And uh, as soon as the bus came to a stop, she immediately went to assist our uh, staff members and the students. She remained calm, and she was a true leader in this uh, accident. I'd also like to recognize Ruth Soto Hussein, our bus attendant, and our supplemental health contract nurse, Pam Masters. Additionally, Dr. Ruby Harris was uh, actually driving on the 290 for an appointment, 
and noticed the bus and had stopped to see how she could assist. Our two transportation mechanics, Jesse Popovich and Zachary Elding, uh, reported to the scene along with head bus driver Amy Virost, the Tonawanda police, the EMT uh, paramedics from that town, and of course our director of transportation, Teresa Lise It was all hands on deck. All of these individuals either were, of course, on hand during the accident or reported there. They were all instrumental in helping uh, move our students off of the bus and onto another bus so that they could be uh, driven home after the EMT paramedics checked out everybody on the bus. The amount of coordination, parent communication, and attention to detail for safety was outstanding. We really are very proud of our transportation team. I know that it's very late, but let's give them a round of applause. And as June said, I'd like to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. Our students have been actively collecting food items for the Neighbors Foundation. Uh, and now this week are collecting toys and gifts for needy, the Grand Island and Buffalo families. The needy Grand Island families are over 30, uh, approaching 38 families that uh, are in need and well over 85 students. So we encourage our students to continue uh, their generosity and goodwill uh, throughout this week, Mr. Broker. And uh, our, uh, our, our students are doing a good job and we encourage them to continue that so that everybody can have a very Merry Christmas and a beautiful holiday and remain safe and festive for the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next meeting is January 10th at Veronica uh, Connor Middle School. Um, with that, I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn at 1025 p.m. please. Okay. Second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Have a nice holiday. <laughs>